I'm Cheryl. I'm Brandon. This we is Luna. Luna. <laughs> We're from near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Gosh. And uh, hoping to get uh, Luna up and, up and flying, at least to the point where we can walk around outside and not have to worry about fly-offs. That's the main thing. Step up on command. Yeah. Be able to fly to me. I love this. It's like, I want to have her also step up. <laughs> <laughs> In a two-hour class. You got these goals for here to here. Thank you. I just need to Very summarize nice. that. Flight training is my, my passion with birds. And, um, and it all honestly does begin with step up. It might feel like we're going through super basic stuff. But that's where the foundations are. Big thing to remember is that anytime you experience failure, we pushed too far too fast, so we need to go back to where it was last working well and slowly rebuild it from there. You'll hear that a lot throughout courses we produce uh, or one-on-one -on -one sessions, and basically what that means is in this environment, we might experience failure right off the bat. It's totally normal. We'll just go back to the what, what are they willing to do, and if we get a target, let's do a target. If they're not, we'll train the target. And then we'll do some step ups and then we'll work on seeing where else we can go. And so we're going to do as much as we can to get as much the results as we can. But that being said, there's always variables that we may run into where there's maybe not the same motivation or something might be different. Mm -hmm. In which case you have two hours of our undivided attention for whatever questions you have. <laughs> yes, uh, we yes. can answer hypotheticals, we can give you direction on where to go. Um, but what we really want to see is how we can help you best get to the goal that you want to achieve and we really will be looking at any minor mistakes we see along the way. I do have to start everyone with diet and sleep because those are the most critical. If those aren't in place, then it's oftentimes really hard to make any difference. So an interesting thing about some masterclass students is that I actually have online consultations with quite a few of them before meeting them in person at a class. And this was the case with Cheryl and Brandon and their Macaw Luna. And one of the things that I think is gonna be incredibly helpful for a lot of you viewers out there dealing with diet conversion is they were feeding so many different things. Um, and I've encountered this with quite a few clients where they're like serving these baked bread bite thingies and these avi cake things and two to three different varieties of pellets and fresh stuff from their fridge and this frozen thing as well and just so many different components without really figuring out which one um, they should dwindle it down to. So my biggest diet conversion tip to all of you that I utilized with Cheryl and Brandon was to simplify the diet before starting the conversion process. So if you're feeding 20 different things, figure out what a majority of your bird's weight is actually coming from out of those things and dwindle it down to just those things and then dwindle it down from there. So if you are serving multiple brands of pellets, dwindle it down to one. It's much easier to convert your bird from one brand of pellet to another brand of pellet than three brands of pellet to a different brand of pellet. Also, chop shouldn't just be whatever the heck is currently in your fridge. You need to make sure that the ratios of grains to legumes to sprouts to vegetables is all adequate for your bird and you need to actually care and prioritize about the nutritional value of foods. We don't need lettuce, for example, to be a daily part of your bird's diet. When their crops are like teeny tiny, the food takes up quite a bit of space. We don't really want to give that real estate away to something like lettuce that has very little nutritional value. We also don't want to overdo it and say, because carrots are a great option, let's give 100% carrots. So 100% of any ingredient is definitely too much when it makes up the entire diet. So please check out more of my diet information at birdtricks.com. I think you were one that were you were feeding so many different things yeah. that I needed it to be like simplified first before we can move on to something. But yeah, as far as the, the fresh food in the morning, as you know, seasonal feeding's best. Right. That way your ratios are correct. If you can't get him to eat the seasonal feeding, that's when we start modifying. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. It sounds like you, you were on your track with the diet conversion, so I won't spend too much time on that. <clears throat> you watched the video with Elliot. The Amazon? Yeah. Yes. 
and uh, I wasn't sure when you wrote in there, we want that. <laughs> That's you, well, because <laughs> it's hard to get Luna motivated to want to fly. Okay. And I thought, I'm like, okay, how am I going to get this guy in the air without like totally freaking him out? So I'd love to see where what you guys have already done. So uh, but I'd love to see where, where I'm, Luna is. I'm assuming it is 0.01% chance that this bird is going to fly. Yeah. I think that we're going to be working on step up. But and, and I'll go with you on that because this isn't probably the best environment to do first flights in, right? But I'm going to step off to the side here and I'd love to see if you can just show me. Like what sort of training you've yeah. done that he already knows? He does the training and I just kind of, I'm along for the ride. This is my pet and this is his training. I'm going to shut up and press. <laughs> As you can see, we struggled pretty hard getting Luna to step up and come out of his cage. He wouldn't do it for Brandon, not even when Cheryl left the room. So Cheryl came back and gave it a try as well, seeing as she said that Luna prefers her. Baby, step up, honey. Oh, you want it? So scared. Luna, step up, Luna. When that didn't work, we tried moving the cage up higher to see if that would help. Uh, Cheryl had told us that Luna doesn't like men, so we tried sitting Dave nearby to see if that would entice Luna to come out, but nothing was working until... And he gets all excited about it. There you go. Hey, good baby. There you go. It's about time. <laughs> now will I go to one of you? If you are an avid masterclass watcher of our videos, then you may have noticed us use this method quite a few times where somebody might be struggling getting their bird out and it might be the placement of the cage, it might just be the brand new environment, it might be the lack of treats that they're actually using. Um, it can be a number of things beyond those. Um, but a lot of the time, if you just open the cage and back up <laughs> and you just allow the bird to make the decision for itself to come out or not, it will almost always choose to come out. This is just kind of giving the animal freedom of choice. Like, hey, do you wanna be in control of the environment? Um, and this really, really can be helpful for getting an animal to choose to do the behavior that you might be coaxing or being like, please, please, please do this. It might come a lot easier if you just back up and allow the animal to do it itself. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys don't always get consistent step ups? Is that kind of? No. Yeah. It's not okay. And then every time you have Luna step up, is it always on your arm? Typically, I've been trying to focus more towards the wrist and hand. That, it, like I said, he really doesn't really like. Just get a lot more hesitancy. Yeah. When he's exposed. And he'll give you a little growl sometimes. Like okay. he's not really happy with it. So. Is there a difference between an exposed arm versus like if your sleeve was all the way down, or does that no. not seem to matter? It's no, just it doesn't. he really wants the arm. Yeah, he just feels better with it. I've been trying to keep trying to keep it more in this position so he's grabbing on like that and it's easier for him and I've been like trying to lure him out to the, yeah. to the hand. Okay. You, you notice how he's kind of holding his upper, upper mandible out slightly and yeah, the tongue's moving like a little? All, yeah. It's just a kind of nervous. He's nervous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so will he step up for you now or what's your, <clears throat> what do you read about him? Yeah, if this was at home, would you have him step up like this or would you wait for him? Oh, he'd step up like this. Yeah. Probably step up. Come on, then. Don't look a liar at me. Okay. How has he been with strangers? Um, he's usually pretty shy. Kind of stuff. So something I would encourage you to, to challenge yourself on. Mm -hmm. Every time you hear yourself speak in absolutes. Yes question it okay. and help each other question it. Okay. So I heard you say he loves car rides. And I question so I said he, Yeah, I mean so far. So like when when you paint the picture, when I ask you what specifically makes you feel like he loves car rides, you say, well he eye pins and he says hi. Woo. And he, Woo. He, yeah, he vocalizes, right? Yeah, so eye pinning is is paired with heightened. Yes. So heightened can be heightened in a good way, can also be in a bad way. Um, Usually talking or vocalizations are paired with a 
uh, a heightened that leads to aggression. Okay. So he may not actually love the car. He might be overstimulated and terrified. So I think this was a really important moment in this masterclass especially when Dave really emphasizes not to speak in absolutes. The reason behind that is because if you get too stuck on my bird loves this or my bird hates that, you take it as factual for the rest of the bird's life and you never give the bird the opportunity to say that this may have changed. Um, I know that all of us change. We don't all fear the same thing throughout our entire life. Sometimes it's different levels of fear or, and or discomfort, and you always need to be ready to analyze that and open to the fact that what was true yesterday may not be true today, so you can't necessarily treat it exactly the same. Um, I hear this a lot with my bird hates vegetables, or my bird hates a specific texture, or my bird hates people with beards. Um, these are things that are definitely things that you can work through if you are open to it, but you also need to have the mental ability to say, is this true today under the circumstances that are presented today? Because if you just change one thing about that scenario, you might have a different outcome. So that's where we get this whole speaking in absolutes. It can really set you up to fail. And I believe that to be true because I think when you speak in absolutes, you believe everything that way, almost as fact, and you stop being open to always reading behavior and being open and willing to what the bird is actually telling you today. He always does this, and I don't know what this is. I don't know what all the ways make him Discomfort right now. Right. He always does this if he's alone on a tree, like a tree stand kind of perch. Yeah. Always. Yeah, they're an incredibly social, like, flock dynamic, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, if they feel vulnerable or isolated, then you'll see behaviors that are different than if they're with the flock. He, to me right now, he just seems very nervous. Retreat. What did you calm down? Get a nice, like, head ruffle, which cannot be, uh, it's called an incompatible behavior. Yeah. So he can't be mad and, like, fixing and ruffling feathers at the same time. So those of you that have been watching our videos for a while have probably seen what a very calm and content bird looks like. That wasn't necessarily it. However, when you are dealing with birds with unknown backgrounds, such as Luna, this is not Luna's first home, uh, you kind of have to take what you can get. And that may mean working in approximations. This is the same thing when it goes to training a bird to bathe. You don't just go from the bird absolutely refusing it, hating water, fearing water, to enjoying it. There's a process in between that looks like Okay, did he not run away as far? Did he care a little less that time so I can reward that? And that was kind of the case here with Luna. Did we see 100% of a calm, content bird? No, because Luna's wings were still out. We still saw some shaking, but what we did see was a little sign uh, from Luna with the little head shake that Dave caught where, hey, we can probably work towards calm by rewarding this behavior and capturing this specific behavior. So when you have birds that are this, ugh, I hate to put a label on it, it's kind of high strung, discontent, uh, I don't totally know what you wanna label it exactly, but definitely not calm, you kind of have to go for those little inklings that you see that you can reinforce for. Because it's really hard to teach a bird what not to do and get rewarded. It's much easier to say like, hey, you're getting a treat for doing this behavior. And so that's kind of what we're working with here. A lot of you that do have trained eyes might have been looking at that with a second glance of like, was that really calm? But we're going for these minute little details because that's all we're probably going to get from Luna at this stage of discontentment. I hope that's a word. You think you calm her on one of them? Hi, sweetheart. Oh, do you want to come see me, baby? Good baby. So I want to go to my cage flat. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It's okay, baby. This is one of our masterclass videos that I feel like needs so much explanation. <laughs> um, so in that particular moment, and I'm going to slow down some of the footage for you guys to be able to really tell, the reason Dave indicated that Luna looks like not necessarily content on Cheryl, but just wants to use Cheryl to get where he wants to go, which is back 
into the comfort of his cage because this new environment is freaking him out um, is because Luna did not calm down necessarily. You still saw a lot of anxious behavior even on Cheryl's arm. You also saw a little bit more emotion with the body where it almost looked like Luna's trying to look past Cheryl to where he wants to go. So that's what made us realize yeah, he stepped on Cheryl really enthusiastically. Does that mean he wants to be with Cheryl? Not necessarily. It actually means that he thinks she could possibly give him what he wants eventually by taking him back to his cage because he's just so uncomfortable in this brand new environment. And it sounds like from what they're explaining of this being pretty normal behavior from him that he's uncomfortable in just about every environment. Uh-huh. I'm probably setting back on the perch just so he doesn't escalate on you. Here you go, baby. May I ask what you teach? Um, uh, pre-K to 12 music. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nope, still not there. No. So not quite down enough. The sunflower seeds nice. that, that he has right now, no, he has not very many. It's a, it's a container of ones I just grew from root, and yeah, I was trying to see if he had receptors to anything, and I think it's a little too... Oh. So far having Luna in class, Luna has refused all food rewards and just dropped them. Now a lot of this is because the foundation of a very good diet, making that treat value higher, is not in place currently. Um, but a lot of it also could be the fact that the environment is so intimidating to Luna that there's no amount of food reward that is worth it to calm down enough to be able to consume a treat. And we've seen this kind of fear in some birds where you just need to make a braver bird out of them before you can actually work, work with food rewards that are then worth it because their fear is so extremely high. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was we only did one repetition where Dave just captured that little tiny head shake that was among all that other body language. And we just had that one rep with a food reward he didn't even consume. And Luna seemed to understand it because if you pay attention and watch that clip again, he offered with the feathers, with the wings down, a full little head shake and body shake, which is usually a sign of being more content. It's something that they'll do before a nap or before preening or something like that. So we are making progress even without being able to use food. Maybe we'll move out for a little bit next to say. them. Okay. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll jump to Avi for a minute. Yeah. So we decide the best thing we can do for Luna at this moment is wait for the fear and discomfort to decrease. And we feel like the best way to go about this is for Luna to use a little bit of observational learning and watch us work with the other bird in this masterclass and just have time out on a tea stand observing, watching, not necessarily being directly worked with or asked to do anything, but just being in this environment and learning that it's non-threatening, nothing's gonna hurt him or come at him in any negative way and just allow him to kind of get comfortable in the space. So let us know what you think so far of this video. There's gonna be a part two, so check out part two. I don't wanna cram too many lessons in just one single video. So I hope you guys are enjoying this content. If you have any interest in attending or hosting one of our Bird Tricks Masterclasses, please contact us info at birdtricks.com. Don't forget to hit that like button, thumbs up this video, subscribe, and turn on your notifications.